All right. Please open your Bibles to 1 Peter. We're going through this letter verse by verse. This week is the uh, sixth week of 1 Peter. If, uh, if you're new or you want to catch up, the sermons are on YouTube and you, could, you can catch up uh, there. Before we begin, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Please join me in going before the throne of God. Father, it is such a privilege to, to just utter the name Father and know that our prayers are heard in heaven, that your throne, which is unapproachable, can be approached because of the confidence and boldness that we've received through Christ, that we are able to pray to you, Father, through Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you now that your Spirit would be in me and that you would speak through me. You would, you would spread truth here today, that your presence would be felt here today, and that we would be changed and impacted for your glory. Lord, let this not be a wasted time. I beg of you, Lord, don't let it be a waste of time. I don't want to stand up here and blow a bunch of hot air. Lord, I need your power. I thank you that we are promised that you don't leave us alone and that you'll be with us till the end of the age and that your spirit will guide us in truth. So I'm standing upon that promise today and I'm asking that we together collectively as a church would see Christ. We would see his glory and we would be edified and encouraged and spurred on to be lights in this world. Father, be here now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Peter. We are, we are starting with verse 13. Follow along with me. Verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The words that Peter have written or wrote to the Christians that were dispersed among Asia Minor in around 65 so AD are just as important today as it was then. These words are the very words of God. We live in a, in, in a, in a culture that is so distracted by trinkets and, and, and electronics and TV shows that for some reason we've lost what is sacred. We've lost reverence in our life. We don't, we don't read these words and stand in awe. But yet... Most of the time, we're indifferent. How do I know that? Because our lives don't change. It doesn't, it's not like Hebrews says where it's a sword. The word of God is a sword. Double-edged. Sharper than a double-edged sword. It divides the heart, the mind, down to the very marrow of our bones. So I'm asking today, please don't come here and be indifferent. Don't come here and close your ears. Pay attention to what God has said. Ask Him. Say, God, please, please change my heart. Change who I am. Change the actions of my life. Our flappers say a lot of things. I know because mine, mine does too. 
But you know what? Your actions will dictate to you what you actually believe. We say a lot of things. But is it a reality in our life? That's the question. So let us, let us listen and let us be edified by the word of God. I draw your attention in verse 13 where it says, therefore. Therefore is one of the most important words in the Bible. And what it does is it's, it draws a connection to what has already been taught. It's not something to skip over. It's actually something to pause and think about. And what we have here is Peter has now begun a transition in this letter. Paul does it all the time. He transitions from this, starting in verse 1 to verse 12, of throwing out some of the most glorious words of truth and theology for us to dwell on and think about. And then he packages it up like, like a bee just buzzing around a flower, getting as much around it as possible. As we go through verses 1 through 12, he's like saying the same thing over with more and more emphasis and more and more glory. And then, bam, he says, therefore, everything I just said, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace. You see, Theology has become a bad word in most churches and in our society today. People hear that word and they, they, they get turned off. They don't want to pay attention. They don't want to learn. They don't want to study. Rather, they want someone to stand up here and make them laugh and, and give them a motivational speech. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm not a life coach. In much respects, I'm a lunatic. But I love God, and I want the people of God to know the one true God. Therefore, you see, theology, what theology does, and the word means the study of God. Why is that a bad word? Why wouldn't you want to know God? People talk about God all the time. But do they know him? Or have they created a God in their own mind to suit their own opinions, to suit their own aspirations? Man will create an idol out of anything, especially in his own mind, in his own opinion. But see, God hasn't left it up to us to just wander around wondering, who is this God? He has revealed himself fully. So therefore, we're out excuse. Theology produces true worship. And true worship leads to true obedience, genuine obedience. Lots of people have grown up, they went to church because they were drugged there. They were drugged there. They, they you know, remember, I, I remember, it doesn't happen so much anymore, maybe I was kind of the last generation, but boy, you got your Sunday best on, you know? And if you went out to play while mom was getting little brother dressed and you got dirty, talk about a whooping. You know, I mean, it was like, Sunday was this obligation instead of a desire to go and be with the people of God and to get to know God. Sunday school, it, and guess what? We made it a religion, much like the Jews. Some, some of the most hurtful, hateful, judgmental people would be the ones dressed up in their Sunday best. You know? Well, you should worship with your kind, you don't belong here with us. When you get away from true theology, you get away from true worship, you get away from not genuine obedience. It becomes obligated obedience. And then it's fake. There's no power in it. 
There's no power. Remember what the Bible says, God examines the heart. Doesn't matter how many times you come to church or go to Bible study or quote the scriptures. The demons quote the scriptures, folks. What's in your heart? Now, understanding that everything that was connected before is the only way we can prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded. You gotta have clear thinking. You've got to renew your mind on truth. Prerequisites for this hope that he's talking about here, setting your hope fully on the grace, you gotta have your minds prepared. You gotta be sober-minded, meaning clear-headed, clear thinking. This isn't essentially talking about being an absence of a chemical substance like alcohol or drugs, although that's part of it. You can't have a clear mind if it's filled up with some mind-altering chemical. But what this is talking about here is that you've got to think clearly upon biblical principles, biblical truth about who God is. Because if you don't, then this hope gets tainted. It, It becomes something what it's not. It becomes a false hope. Much like a false Jesus. People talk about, they believe in Jesus, they know Jesus, but when you get to talk to them, their Jesus looks nothing like the biblical Jesus. Well then, therefore it's not Jesus. So setting your hope, if your mind's not right upon truth, and it's not clear upon the truth, then what happens is the hope becomes something it's not. See it in, the, in these circles of prosperity gospel teachers. What is their hope in? Here. It's in here. I mean, you go to the bookstore. It's all over the books. The best life now. No, a best life is not now. If your best, John MacArthur says this, and I think it's brilliant. If your best life is now, it's the only life you're going to have. And then in another book, I was walking by, it says, The Power of The I am. What a blasphemous title. The power of the I am? We don't have time to go into that, but give me a break. Okay. Hope. Notice it's a command. Okay? This is a command. We are told, preparing your minds for action. Another translation says, gird up the loins of your mind. It's a picture. So in in that day and age, they they wore um, clothes that had to be kind of girded up, wrapped up, tied up. You know, you look like a sumo wrestler. They're wearing this thing. It's all tied up. It's tight. They're prepared for action. Okay? The same thing that Moses told the Israelites. Be ready. Be geared up. Gored up the loins before the morning when they exited out of Egypt. Jesus tells us the same thing in Luke chapter 12. He says, stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Remember, Jesus said he will come at a time you least expect it. Be ready. Be watchful. Be on guard. Were you on guard this week? Were you ready for Christ to strike open the sky like a scroll and come across the eastern sky like a lightning bolt? Gather the elect from the four winds to stand before him. Were you ready? Get ready. Be ready. Be sober-minded. Prepare your minds for action. Once you've done that, command, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is very important. This is powerful for your living. This is powerful for your daily life. If It doesn't say set your hope partly. It says fully. Another translation is completely. All of it. All of your hope on the grace that will be brought to you. Notice it says you don't have to chase it down. You don't have to run and go get it. It's brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's already been brought. You live as you are already. 
How do I know that? Well, Jesus has been revealed, folks. The gospel has been revealed. The coming of Christ, dying on the cross, resurrecting from the dead. The spirit of God coming to dwell in us. It's been revealed. Set your hope fully. Set your hope fully on the grace. Well, see, that grace is connected to all the things before, right? You were born again to a living hope. You were chosen by God before the foundation of the world, foreknown, foreordained to be adopted into his family, to be his son. We have an inheritance kept in heaven, shielded by the power of God, guarded, uncorruptible, unfading, undefiable. Set your hope on that, this living hope. Let us not walk through life being distracted by the things of life that drags us down so that we don't look or walk or act as if we have any hope at all. Peter says, be ready to testify to anyone who asks of you of the hope that is in you. What's the difference between faith and hope? Faith, we're told in in Hebrews 11, verse 1, Things hoped for and certain of the things not seen. We have faith in what Jesus has done already. We have confidence and we have hope for what is to come. Jesus has been revealed and he's being revealed and he will be revealed and he's coming with grace. Now, moving on. Verse 14 As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Okay? It also can be translated as children who are obedient. Children who are obedient. Remember, we as Christians are part of the family of God. Why do, why do some call themselves Christians, but yet like, they look nothing like their father? In the Jewish culture, rabbis would gather together Talmudim or Talmud disciples. Okay? And it was the desire of those disciples to be like the rabbi. Jesus, talking about this, he says, it's not enough for the disciples to be greater than their teacher, but for them to be like the rabbi. That was the culture. And when, when the rabbi would choose his disciples, he was saying to them, you can be like me. Jesus has chosen you. And therefore saying you can be like him. Now, we must understand most Jews today, you talk to them and you ask them in Israel, and I'm speaking from a uh, Christian historian who, who lived in Israel, worked in Israel, studied in Israel, and he would ask the, the Jews within his class, why, why have you rejected Jesus or Yeshua as the Messiah? And, and overwhelmingly, you know what they say? Because his Talmud, his disciples, look nothing like him. Therefore, he must be a false rabbi. The nations blaspheme my name on the account of your actions. So, Children who are obedient or as obedient children. We must not be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. Now, what does conformed mean? It means being formed into, taking the form, the likeness of. Now follow me here. We were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. But at the fall, we inherited the sinful nature. And therefore, we are contrasted completely from God, holy and pure, to the one whose thoughts are evil continually. Examine your own heart. You know it's true. Now, contrast that. Think about this. 
It says here, as obedient children, what does that mean? Children represent the family. And in this culture, represents the father of the family. If you're not obedient, the culture says, then you have dishonored the family and the family name. You look nothing like the family. Now, do not be conformed to the passions to take on the likeness of your former lusts, your former passions before Christ. Jesus says that if your eyes are tainted, your whole body will be tainted. What's in the heart comes out of the mouth. We can be formed into the likeness of our passions and lusts. It will take you over. The old saying, right? Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will make you stay longer than you want to stay. It, it lies. It's deceitful. Fun for a little while till it gets its hooks in you. That's why we're told here, no, no, no. As obedient children, represent your father in obedience to him, in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you are now conforming to his likeness. You're no longer conforming to the passions of your former lusts. Your former passions, and those passions are strong in your former ignorance. What does ignorance mean? Lack of knowledge, okay? The Bible sometimes explains this as darkened understanding. Imagine yourself in a dark room. There's no light. Can you see? You cannot see because you're in a dark room. There's no light. That's the state in which we all were before Christ, Ephesians 2. All were dead in your trespasses and sins. All together by nature were objects of God's wrath. But God, who is mercy and love, made us alive. See, once you have received the truth of the gospel and its power, you're no longer in ignorance. You're no longer in the darkened understanding of who God is. And this was written to both Jew and Gentile. You see, their, their ignorance was they didn't recognize the Messiah. Even though, as I said last week, it's all throughout the writings explaining exactly who he is and who he would be, how he would come, how he would die, how he'd be resurrected. But they were in ignorance. They had darkened understanding. And then for the Gentile, like us, no concept of God at all. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Because when we do that, we are actively participating in the rejection of our father and the rejection of our husband. What do I mean by husband? The bride of Christ is his church. Paul says, I promised you to one husband to be holy, spotless, and blameless. This is why Paul talked to the Corinthians and he said, purge the evil one from among you. That person who's in church and refuses to repent. Well, that's harsh. Yeah, well, would you want your wife running around? Participating with other men? The Bible compares this to spiritual adultery. Now, why is it important to dwell and think upon these things, these truths, because they motivate you to stay pure and to stay obedient. They keep you from wandering into your former lusts and passions. In Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world. Same thing, it's the same command. Don't be taken up the likeness of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Jesus said to the Father in John 17, sanctify them, set them apart, make them separate by your truth. Your word is truth. Dwell upon it. And remember, 2 Peter 2.22, what is true of the proverb has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. That can make your stomach kind of turn if you think about it. But that's the image, folks, of the one who is now a child of God, who has been given this grace to set their hope fully upon, who has been sprinkled by the blood of Christ and sanctified by the Holy Spirit to return to their former ignorance, which is no ignorance at all because your mind isn't darkened anymore. It's like going and eating your own vomit. It's pretty sickening. But that's what God uses. So I have to preach it. And guess what? Sometimes it may help you. If you are tempted to run back to something that you know is unpure, to an impure cistern, and you know it will conform you to it. It's bad for you. It will make you, it will mold you into it. Picture it as vomit. Think about that. And then, Turn your thoughts to the purity of God, the love that he has given you, the forgiveness of your sins through his blood, the foreordination of your life and the calling of you to be in his family. That begins to renew your mind so that you can present yourself to him as a living sacrifice. The battle, folks, is here. This is where Satan will attack you. This is where your emotions and your heart can be, can be uh, jacked up by the choices that we make. It attached, they're spiritual strongholds. Fornication is harmful. Adultery is harmful. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse is harmful. They harm you and those around you. Wrong thought patterns, covetedness, Jealousy, rage, anger, bitterness. These things are the former ways of our ignorance. No, we have been called to love, to have peace, to have patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. How do you do this though? How do you, how do you stop being conformed to the ways of the world and your former lusts. Number one, you gotta prepare your minds for action. This is a daily thing. You wake up and you prepare your mind for action. You take on the armor of God. You don't run towards those things. You stay away from them. You run, you flee if you have to. You fight with the word of God and his truth. You write it upon your heart. How does a young man keep his way pure? By living According to your word, I've written your word upon my heart that I might not sin against you. There's power in the word of God. There's power in the spirit of God. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Right? Romans says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. There's, there's, a, there's lots of people out there today that teach, well, you have, you have no power. You just, you gotta submit to God. You lay, lay down and then God will do it. The Bible over and 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 over says, purify yourselves. Flee, run, stand firm, resist the devil. These are commands for you, the individual. There's no excuse to say, well, if God don't do it, I, I haven't read that in the Bible, although I'd love it to be there. I'd love for it to say, hey, my struggles, there's nothing I can do about it. When God sovereignly decides he's gonna remove this, I'll be there and ready. But instead, I'm told to what? Prepare my mind for action. Be sober-minded. Think, think of a, a man in battle, a, a, somebody in war. They're out on patrol, right? You're on point. You're the first one out. In, in the military, they put, in the infantry, they put a guy out, you know, 50 yards out in front of everybody else. Why? 
so that if there's a sniper in front of you or there's a booby trap or something, that guy gets it first and the rest of the platoon get, is saved. You think this guy's out there on point just whist whistling Dixie, just hanging out, you know, not paying attention? No. That guy is scared out of his mind. He's alert. He smells things. He can hear a twig snap. He's alert. He's sober-minded. And he stays alive. And he keeps his men alive. This is the picture, folks. Paul says, I don't box the air aimlessly, but I train as a soldier for Christ. I don't get involved in civilian affairs, but I aim to please the commanding officer, Christ. Sober-minded. How do you do it? You got to have a desire. By the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, the flesh. When you're angry, make a choice in your mind, right? Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath, upon your anger. If that means you must stay up with your spouse till the sun comes up again and work it out, you do it. You don't give the devil a foothold. Now, John 15, flip there right, real quick. And then we'll move on to the next verse. John 15, starting in verse 4. This is the Lord. This is Jesus, the King. He says, abide in me. What does it mean to abide? Do, do you take, when you're reading the Bible, do you stop on wor individual words and ask yourself, what does this word mean? If you don't, start doing it. Start doing it. These words are there because guess what? God put them there. They're important, every one of them. There's not one in here that is meaningless. You gotta, you gotta think that way. Abide in me and I in you. See, it's a relationship. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, okay? You cannot produce the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and guess what? Self-control. That is not a fruit of me, of Sean, and it ain't a fruit of you, no matter who you are. You can't. You cannot do it. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Why do we let Monday go by without getting upon your knees and calling upon God? I'll tell you, because I do the same. Because I'm too self-reliant. I'm too confident. I got this. Because guess what? If I was truly dependent upon God, I would know no matter how I feel, no matter how busy I am, I would know a branch cannot bear fruit by itself. There it is. Unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Don't let a day go by without seeking God. And if you do, check yourself. Check yourself. Because guess what? You're, you're trying to produce fruit on your own. And we're told we can't do that. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's my life verse. From the moment I became a Christian, God's been hammering that into me. I haven't learned it yet, but I'm trying. I'm trying. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask, and whatever you, whatever you wish, it will be done for you. God, cause me to walk in more holiness. Cause me to walk in more pur purity. Cause me to love you more. Cause me to love my wife more. Cause me to be patient with my children when they're running around the house screaming and throwing a football and breaking things and I'm trying to sell the place. Give me patience, God. Go to God. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. This is not talking about a new house or a car or promotion. This is talking about the mission of God, and that is to be conformed to the image of his son and to make his name known across the nations, everyone you come in contact with. As Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Back to motivation again. How are you going to be motivated to be obedient children if you're not thinking upon, wow, I was adopted by God. I was adopted by God. I'm his son. I'm in his family. I have the blessings of God. I have an inheritance. How are you going to be obedient? What's going to motivate you? What's going to motivate me? If you're not abiding in his love. What greatest love is this? That he has bestowed upon us. To call us his children. That we should think about the rest of the day. You're a child of God if you're in Christ. Not everybody. I hear it all the time. We're all children of God. No we're not. We're children of wrath. That's what the Bible says. Oh I don't like that. I don't care. It's the truth. That's harsh, I know. The, the, listen, Noah's Ark is not a painting in a children's book with a rainbow and flowers and, and, and a dove flying around. It's six billion people drowning to death. And then you have God's grace and his promise. And that rainbow, he says, I'll never do this again by water. But as we keep going through Peter, you'll find out he's going to do it by fire. What greatest love is this? That he has called us his child. His child. Our first priority is to be his child. To love him. Enjoy him. His fellowship. Only then you'll have the motivation to be obedient. And to love others. And to forgive others. I see it. You know sometimes in my own heart. The lack of forgiveness. Who are we folks? To hold on to some bitterness. When we've been forgiven, you can't do that unless you're in the vine. We'll be producing our own fruit and it stinks, it's rotten, it's no good for nobody, right? I mean, think about it. You, you've known some folks in your life, they're not genuine, they're fake, right? And they only want to take, 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 take the whole relationship. They're just taking from you everything, just take, 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 take. That's the kind of fruit we produce outside of Christ. It's the truth. Now, Verse 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. What do you do with that? What, what do you do with that? Be holy as I am holy. What? What? I know for, for me, a lot of times I'm just like, oh, okay. I don't have a clue how to do that. What do you mean be holy as I am holy? Remember, what, what does holy mean? What does it mean? It means to be fundamentally separated, peculiar, unique. God is holy. He is in his own category. There is no one or nothing like him. Not even close. Everything transcends from him and everything transcends back to him. All of his creation, he is over reigning over all of it. He is holy. He's the only thing that is holy. Do you realize that? Nothing in all creation is holy except for God. But what does he say? He starts to call us these words saints. And listen, folks, saints are not these people who lived a long time ago and they're voted in by some men. That's not what the Bible teaches. Saints are people who are sanctified, separated by God. The Greek word is hagios. Hagios. It means to be separated. It's, it's full characteristic of God-likeness. It's more comprehensive than just being pure or clean or morally good. It includes God 
likeness. Now, I've just spent the last 25 minutes talking about our dependence upon him and our unholiness when we're not dependent upon him. How can God call men to be holy as he is holy? How? How do you reconcile that? How do you get up in the morning and live your life for being holy, to being like God? How do you do it? Well, you gotta renew your mind. You see, you have to understand. It says right here, look, verse 15. But as he who called you. Okay, what is that? He called you. You didn't call him. You didn't call him. He called you. If you're in Christ, it's because Christ called you. That alone makes you holy. That alone makes you separate. That's what church, the word church, ekklesia, called out. Called out of what? The world, the general population. Called out, separated, put over here in an assembly of God's people in his family. That alone makes you holy. You're cleansed by the blood of Christ. That makes you holy. You're indwelt by the spirit of of God. That makes you holy. What is he saying here? Live out what you already are. Live it out in action. In everything you do, everything fundamentally in your life, live it out. Can you be sinless in this side of life? No, but the Bible does not give us an excuse for that. You know that? But instead it says, be holy as I'm holy. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, uh, the standard. That's it. No other excuse. Be holy as I'm holy. But you've got to prepare your mind for that. You've got to set your hope fully on the grace that is to come. You've got to dwell upon the truths and promises of God. Or else... You'll have, okay, think of an engine that's built. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. It goes very fast, it's very powerful, but it does not have the fuel to make it run. No matter how wonderfully it's built, it cannot run without the proper fuel. Our holiness, our obedience, our bringing glory to God cannot and will not happen until we have the proper motivation, the fuel, and that is upon his truth, promises, goodness, and his word. You've got to dwell on those things. Wake up in the morning, be holy. As I go to work, things are gonna come, man. You're gonna have that annoying person come to you at work. You're gonna be that annoying person at work. And school, right? But take Take the time to get with God. Beg him. Cause me to be holy. Don't be, listen, it's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to get on your knees and pray like this. God, there are evil things in my life. There are things in my heart that are, that are completely opposed to you. Do whatever you have to do to remove it from me. Whether that's I'm fully exposed before men or whatever you have to do. Grind me to powder to remove this from me. That's a fearful thing to pray. But it's worth it. Because he is worthy of a spotless bride. He died for us. He died for us. He's a worthy husband. He's a great husband. We should conform to God, right? Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. There it is, there's your motivation. How are you gonna be an imitator of God? Because you're a beloved child. You abide in his love and it produces fruit. Notice Back, uh, just draw our attention back to verse 14. As obedient children. Notice it doesn't say as obedient slaves. It's not under obligation. The grace of God has appeared to all men and it motivates us to what? Say no to ungodly things. Titus chapter three. Now, God has called us 
to be holy as he is holy. He has called us to have his likeness and his characteristics. You do that through the motivation of his love, grace, mercy, kindness, promises that our sins are forgiven, the hope that we are going to be with him forever and rule and reign with him. He he says in the new covenant promises, I'll never stop doing good to you. We must prepare our minds for action. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Be clear in your thinking, right? Sober-minded and set our hope fully on the grace. We must be the children of God. That should influence the way we act. That should influence the way we interact with people. It should influence what you do when you're alone. And it's our first priority to sit at the feet of Christ, to see yourself as his bride, to see yourself as the child of the Father, to see yourself indwelt by the Spirit of God. These are highly weighty things. These are, these are diamonds of God but he's given them to us. Grab them off the shelf, folks. Carry them around with you. Put off the old man. It stinks. Put on the new man. Be regenerated. Renew your thinking. Be godly. Be holy. Be in fellowship with the Spirit. By the Spirit, you put the death, the deeds of the body. And keep yourself from things that wage war against your soul. You know what they are. And if you don't know what they are, ask God. He'll show you. There's things on that TV in that box in your house. There's things on there that wage war against your soul. There's things that you listen to that wage war against your soul. There's things you look at with your eyes that wage war against your soul that wants to conform you into its likeness. And remember what I said last week? The angels look into the actions of the church to have the manifold wisdom of God displayed to them. That also is motivation to abide in him. And lastly, be separate from the world. Don't be friends of the world. Shine in the world. Stay dressed for action like Jesus said. Let your lamps keep burning. How do you do that? A desperate heart. A desperate heart that wants God. Blessed are those who are what? Spiritually bankrupt. Right? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed. Pour it out. Pour out your flesh and be filled by God. And you can, do, you can start making little steps. Get up in the morning. I don't care, two minutes. Two minutes better no minutes. Start praying. Start asking God to make you more holy. Start asking God to fill you with his spirit. Remember what I said. If you're called, you're already holy. Live it out. Live it out. Let's pray. Father, It is a privilege to read these words and and to hear them and to dwell on them and to think about them. Lord, I, I, I am grateful that you've called us to be holy and to be separate, that we can engage the world with the fragrance of Christ. We don't have to be like the world. We don't have to send out postcards to shirts and Siblo and ask the world what they want in a church to be impactful. Let us just be obedient to Christ and love others and love you. That's plenty of impaction. That's plenty of power. We don't even need other things. Let us do that, God. Let us be people who love each other here. Let us be people who help one another with a servant's attitude. Let us be like Christ and get on our knees and wash the feet of the saints. God, I'm asking that you would increase our power here and you would increase our obedience and that we would see the motivation is through love. It's through the motivation of we're part of your family now. I mean, what else more do we need? We've been called by you. We've been been predestined. Those you predestined, you called. It's amazing. It's amazing. 
So Lord, this week I pray for this church and for myself that we would go forth and that we would take your word seriously and that we would not be self-reliant and that we'd realize without you and without being part in, connected in the vine, we're not going to produce any fruit. Let us do that. In Jesus' name, amen.